Good morning. It is good to see you on this last Wednesday of March. I hope the month has been good to you. Thank you very much as always for joining us on My Doctor. My name is Winnie Lubembe. Now, about 10% of the world's population is infected with amoebas and of course particularly people li who live in Mexico, uh, India, Central America, South America, Africa and the tropical areas of Asia. And of course in industrialized countries, amoebiasis is most common in uh, recent immigrants and travelers who visit countries where amoebas are prevalent. So what is it exactly about amoebas that of course affects some parts of the world and not the others. Well, we have that and much more on today's discussion on my doctor. And of course, we'll be focusing on amoeba. So we want to stick around till the end of the show, but just in case you have a question, uh, we're live. So that means you can call in anytime you want with your question. The number is 0791478990 or alternatively, if you call in and the lines are busy, don't worry, send us an SMS on 40975 with your name and of course your question and we'll answer it as soon as we get it. So to help us better understand more on amoeba or amoebiasis, uh, I am joined by Willie, but of course I'll give him a chance to introduce himself. So good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for making time for us uh, on My Doctor today. So before we get into everything amoeba or amoebiasis, kindly introduce yourself. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Rand Kesh Muticia Willie. I'm a lecturer at Chuka University. Okay. Yeah. All, all right. Now, I know this is a term that most of us have heard. Um, and most of the time you hear that when, whenever someone has probably like some sort of stomach ache, they would tell you, uh, yeah. that is what we always say, amoeba. But from what you said is amoeba, not yeah. amoeba. So yeah. let's just go back to the basics and, and just talk about what is amoeba exactly. Okay. Um, amoeba is... Uh, a protozoan. It is uh, one of the microorganisms mm -hmm. which uh, cause diseases in human beings. Okay. And naturally, you will find amoeba in soil mm -hmm. and in water. Mm -hmm. uh, we have various types of amoeba, mm -hmm. but the ones which are known to cause diseases in human beings mm -hmm. is uh, what we call uh, an amoeba histolytica. Mm -hmm. That is the one which is uh, uh, most uh, disease causing. Mm. We have others, they may be found in human beings, they may be found in animals, mm -hmm. but they may not cause a severe disease. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now we have um, very many, I would say, terminologies related to the same. Um, we have the amoeba itself, and yeah. then we have ame amoebiasis, amoebiasis, and then there's amoeba infection, amoeba disease. I mean, uh -huh. are they all um, the same, or do they mean different things? Oh, they are somewhat related mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that when you're talking about amoeba mm -hmm. and uh, when it gets now into a person and it is causing disease, mm -hmm. you would be calling it amoebiasis okay. or amoeba infection. Mm -hmm. That is the presence of amoeba yeah. within the body. All right. And uh, when it starts now to cause disease, mm -hmm. uh, because you may have an infection mm -hmm. and you don't have the features. Yeah. Of, 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 of being ill. Mm -hmm. So we'll be saying that the person is having the infection, mm -hmm. but they are not showing the clinical features, features of the yeah. illness. Okay. Yeah. Right, so it's possible for someone to have the infection, but not the, like be as asymptomatic. Yeah. That is what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. And of course, we'll get more on the symptoms later on. But now, um, how common is it? Because I've heard people talk about, you know, I mean, but like I said, when we started the show, whenever they have like a stomach bug or stomach ache. But how common is it right now? Because I think over time, the cases have reduced because we've not had so many cases. But from mm -hmm. your point of view, how common is it, especially in the country? I mean, BSCs is a common infection. Mm -hmm especially in developing countries. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly in our setting, you will find amoebias is being common mm -hmm. in uh, where you have challenges of getting uh, clean water mm -hmm. and where you have uh, poor hygienic conditions. Mm -hmm. It is more common in people who have uh, low socioeconomic status. Mm -hmm. uh, in Nairobi, you will find major of the cases of amoebiasis mm -hmm. coming from the slums, people mm -hmm. living in, so, uh, in low socioeconomic 
status mm -hmm. and where they have challenges of getting water. Mm -hmm. uh, you will also find, because of now, those two, when they are combined, mm -hmm. you will find most of the cases will be found in school-going children, yeah. especially those between the ages of 10 to 14, they are about, mm -hmm. you will find that they are more at risk mm -hmm. of presenting with a disease. But mm -hmm. It affects all people. Okay. Yeah. All right. And and is that why we have the cases in, let's say, Mexico, India, Central America, South America? Is it the same? Because you say most of the time it, have, it affects um, most of the countries that are sort of underdeveloped and do not have, like, let's say, much access to water and sanitation as well. Yeah, pretty so. You, mm. You'll find, uh, because it has got to do with hygiene, mm. then where you have challenges of water, mm -hmm. where you have challenges of how to dispose human waste, mm. and also the knowledge itself, mm. you find that the burden goes up. Okay. So, so the cases tend to increase. All right. Yeah. Okay. Now let's talk about, um, because you said children are more at risk, but what are some of the risk factors for this, for someone getting, um, you know, the infection, aside from, of course, the children, and of course, we can understand why mm -hmm. um, they're more at risk, but aside from that, what are some of the other risk factors for this? Yeah, just as I've said, the mm -hmm. main risk factors mm -hmm. have got to do with uh, access to water, water. Mm -hmm. and disposing human waste. Mm -hmm. So when you combine those two, you really have the risk factors which surround the issues of getting water. Like mm. now when we talk about access to water, you may have water, but where is the water coming from? Yeah. Water from water vendors mm -hmm. is known to be very risky water, mm. as opposed to water which is coming from, running from uh, the city cans or taps. Mm. Uh, it, it, it's safer. That water from the city cans or taps mm. is safer mm -hmm. than the water which is coming from the bowsers because you don't know where they're getting their they get, water yeah. from. Mm. The guys who are moving with the jerry cans when you have water shortage and they are moving with their microcotonies and mm. selling water to you, mm. uh, you will have to think twice before you make use of that water for drinking mm -hmm. purposes okay. directly from their containers. Okay. Yeah. And then we also have some people who... Um, probably use water from the borehole yeah. and then let's say if the borehole is where probably close, close to a sewer or mm -hmm. something like that yeah. because they are also at risk so yeah, they might not necessarily risk. come from the slum yeah. but of course the where the borehole or where the water source is puts them at at, um, at risk yeah pretty so okay pretty so. all right so let's talk about what happens like pretty much simple in a layman's language mm -hmm. what happens when the bacteria mm -hmm. gets into the body Okay. What happens from, from that? Uh, the parasite mm -hmm. gets into the body through the mouth, mm -hmm. either by drinking water mm -hmm. or taking contaminated food. Okay. And when it gets in the body, mm -hmm. that time it is in the form of uh, what we call a cyst. Mm -hmm. A cyst is a dormant state mm -hmm. of the parasite. Mm -hmm. And when it gets into the body, when it is in that form, mm -hmm it does not get destroyed by the gastric acid in the stomach. Mm -hmm. So it will go past the stomach mm -hmm. and get into the intestine. Okay. In the intestine, now the cyst will germinate mm -hmm. and form an, uh, into another form mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of amoeba, which we call uh, trophosoids. Mm -hmm. Now, these trophosoids are the ones which now will start causing the problem. Mm -hmm. As they move downwards, the digestive system, mm -hmm. uh, they will continue to multiply. Mm -hmm. And uh, they will attach on the inner lining of the, the intestines. Mm -hmm. And uh, as they do that, they will be releasing some chemicals mm -hmm. and some of them may start now to, to get deeper on the, on the lining. Mm -hmm. And as that happens, the process of food absorption gets interfered with mm -hmm. and because of also the chemicals they are producing, okay. uh, diarrhea comes in. Mm -hmm. So one will start uh, having diarrhea. Uh, from the time they swallow, the cyst may be up to about four days. Okay. Some of them will now will start complaining of abdominal pains mm -hmm. and then uh, these abdominal pains will be followed by diarrhea. Mm -hmm. The diarrhea initially may not have blood in it, mm -hmm. but as they continue as uh, those uh, trophosoids continue to multiply and mm -hmm. go deeper. Uh, there may be bleeding, mm -hmm. and at that point in time, uh, the kind of stool which the person is passing mm -hmm. will now be having mucus mm -hmm. 
and blood stained mm -hmm. okay. and the abdominal pains will uh, keep on uh, increasing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this kind of feeling where one is having an abdominal pain mm -hmm. and there is the urge to go to the toilet mm -hmm. and you rush, uh, that kind of phenomenon. So okay. it continues like that. Mm -hmm. uh, now, as that progresses, the ones which will have gotten into the deeper structures, mm -hmm. they may find their way mm -hmm. into blood. Oh, and when they okay. get into blood, mm -hmm. they can be transported to the liver, okay. uh, to the lungs, mm -hmm. uh, to the brain, okay. and to the kidneys. And when they get into those places, mm -hmm. they, they cause uh, other forms mm -hmm. of amoebiasis, mm -hmm. which are more severe. Okay. Uh, although they may be they, they may take a longer time, okay. but they are also Before severe. Okay. Well, what is more critical and what will make people rush to the health facility is mm -hmm. the diarrhea. Okay. Because if that continues, then somebody's losing water, they'll mm -hmm. get dehydrated and things like that. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, just going back, yeah. why is it that, because other cases of, let's say, if there is an infection or um, you know, a viral infection, of course, there's a way the body tends to, to fight it. Mm -hmm. But now for this case, um, yeah. from what you said, of course, it goes from the mouth all the way to, to the... Uh, digestive system yeah why isn't the body able to sort of like fight um you know to fight them mm -hmm. in the case where someone is come, might have it but not but then you know become asymptomatic yeah mm -hmm. yeah in, in fact uh, you said very well in some people it mm -hmm. will be asymptomatic yeah. uh, because what happens is uh, depending on the number of of the deceased one mm -hmm. has ingested maybe okay. in water or in food uh that number is what will go past the stomach. Mm. At the moment it gets past the stomach, mm -hmm. they will germinate into those forms, okay. which are called trophocytes. Mm. And uh, those forms are the ones which cause disease. In some people, mm. as they move down uh, towards the, the rectum, mm. they convert again and they become cysts. Mm. So you can have somebody mm. who once had uh, active you know, disease of amoeba, mm -hmm. and now they are not having the signs, mm -hmm. uh, probably they got sick two, three days, and uh, uh, somehow they, they recovered, yeah. and uh, they go on with their life. But they are passing the cysts mm -hmm. in their stool, mm -hmm. and those people are infectious. They can infect others. Mm -hmm. So as they pass those cysts, mm -hmm. and they get into the environment, mm -hmm. uh, they can infect others. Mm -hmm. uh, in some cases where hygienic conditions are not very good, somebody may go to the washroom, uh, come back, mm -hmm. they don't wash their hands, mm -hmm. and they probably they picked some of the cysts from their own stool, mm -hmm. and through their fingers they put it again in the in mouth. The, mouth. Yeah. the process continues. And that is why I said it is common in children. Actually, mm -hmm. that is the process mm -hmm. which keeps on repeating itself. Mm -hmm. And so it is important that when one has that uh, abdominal discomfort, mm -hmm. they go to the other facility, they get checked, mm -hmm. because we have tests of confirming mm -hmm. what is the problem. Okay. And uh, if it is found that it is an amoeba histolytica, mm -hmm. you are given appropriate treatment, which will take care of both uh, those trophocytes mm -hmm. and the cysts, so mm -hmm. that you also become safe to the, to, to, to the environment. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, and in terms of um, the children, we said, of course, children are more at risk, and then, of course, we talked about the cycle, how it goes on. Yeah. But now, when it comes to the infection itself, is it more severe in children as compared to the adults? or it's pretty much the same? Uh, I would say it depends mm -hmm. because uh, there are three de factors which will uh, influence mm -hmm. how an infection will progress in a person. All right. uh, the first thing is their own state. Mm -hmm. The person who is getting infected, how strong are, are they, they? Okay. so that they can fight you know, the, the infection. And the mm -hmm. second one mm -hmm. is how much of the disease-causing organism mm -hmm. they have ingested. Uh, and, and the third one, which is related to the organism itself, is how severe, mm. uh, in terms of um, how tough is this that organism is. to okay. cause the disease. Mm -hmm. So those are the things which will be at play mm. when we are talking about who comes down first with mm -hmm. the infection, mm -hmm. who is likely to survive without medication, mm -hmm. and uh, who is likely to keep on being down, up, down, up, because we have those cases mm -hmm. where somebody gets infected and, uh, okay, they, they go on with their life, but mm -hmm. they are having uh, problems like every uh, two weeks. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Somebody is complaining of abdominal upsets, uh, mild diarrhea, it declares off, mm -hmm. you know, those kind of things up and down. Okay. So it will depend. Okay. It will depend on the individuals. But because children, their immunity is still not as strong, mm -hmm. you find that they, they will be mm -hmm. more vulnerable. Okay. Yeah. All right. And, and then also, how long does it take for the children to show some of this um, signs and symptoms? Mm -hmm. um, because you said it could take like up to four days before yeah. someone starts showing some of the signs and symptoms. Yeah. So we can start with the children. How, after how long do they start showing the symptoms or it's mm -hmm. pretty much the same? Uh, basically, the four days is like uh, the shortest time for everybody. Oh, wow. Because okay. uh, that is the time the parasite will take mm. when it gets into the stomach to get into those pro, uh, to those uh, trophozoids, mm -hmm. and for the trophozoids to multiply, mm -hmm. to get to a number mm -hmm. where they can now start causing trouble mm -hmm. within, the, within the human body. Okay. Yeah. And are there things that might uh, trigger the trophozoids to either, let's say, multiply faster? Faster. Yeah. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. uh, I've not come across any literature mm -hmm. uh, trying to explain that. Mm -hmm. but. What will uh, influence is uh, especially the immune status of the person. Okay. And sometimes we have, we have some strains mm -hmm. of the, uh, the, the parasite mm -hmm. which are more severe. Mm -hmm. So if you have the severe type, mm -hmm. the ones which are associated with outbreaks and things mm -hmm. like that, okay. then you are likely to be in bigger trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Now let's address signs and symptoms in mm -hmm. general because we said I mean it's more or less the same in children and in adults. Yeah. And we also mentioned something to do with the diarrhea. Yeah. Uh, you know and all that. So before the diarrhea literally comes mm -hmm. comes to play. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the signs and symptoms so that people do not confuse um, amoeba yeah. or amoebiasis for just a normal um, you know stomach upset. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, initially what will be the earliest signs will be abdominal discomfort. Mm. Where one is having, a, it's like constipation, not constipation, mm -hmm. increased passing of gas, mm -hmm. you know, general abdominal discomfort. Mm -hmm. And then it will progress. Mm -hmm. And uh, it will progress to now real abdominal pain. pain. Okay. And uh, this pain will be the kind of pain where you get the pain, mm -hmm. and the moment you have the pain, you have the urge. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that kind of thing. Yeah. You have the pain, and it gives you the urge to visit uh, the washroom. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you go there, and you do whatever you're doing, you come back. Mm -hmm. uh, that may go on. In some people, mm -hmm. as, the, as the disease progresses, mm -hmm. you will have this urge of uh, you know, passing your stool, mm -hmm. and you go to the washroom, and nothing is coming out. So mm -hmm. you, you keep on straining, uh, you, nothing is coming out, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of thing. Okay. And, this now, at this stage, where you are having a diarrhea, which may be blood stained, mm -hmm. there will be now fever. Mm -hmm. The person who now will develop fever, fever. Mm -hmm. because now it is, it is becoming serious mm -hmm. and the body is fighting back. Mm -hmm. uh, as diarrhea progresses, there will be loss of body water mm -hmm. and uh, body minerals, electrolytes, mm -hmm. and those will present uh, basically the earliest features will be those of dehydration, okay. somebody feeling thirsty, mm -hmm. and uh, depending on what electrolytes are getting more lost, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, there may be other complications. Okay. Uh, but the loss of water is the main thing, mm -hmm. and that comes with general body weakness, mm -hmm. uh, you know, generally feeling weak and looking healed. Mm -hmm. So that is what now will drive people to say, ah, this is becoming serious, yeah. and they will rush to the hospital. Okay. But the earlier, the better. Mm -hmm. yeah, the moment okay. you start having that abdominal discomfort, mm -hmm. you are having uh, loose stools, not blood stained, just having mucus, mm -hmm. go to the other facility. Don't wait. Okay. Yeah. All right. And just out of curiosity, yes. the blood stain, um, is it, let's say, from, I mean, yeah, where does it come from exactly? Because someone might be like, okay, wait, so um, the bacteria is inside, let's say, the in intestines. Mm -hmm. Does it sort of like eat up on the walls? Or what exactly happens that we have um, cases of blood stains um, in this tool? All right. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier on, I said uh, those trophozoids, mm -hmm. some of them will start to kind of burrow within the, mm -hmm. the inner lining. Okay. And so as they go deeper, mm -hmm. they are now eating up. Mm -hmm. They are heating up. Uh, uh, the inner lining, lining yeah. and initially somebody will start passing mucus mm. in stool, then there will be white flags which are now, the, 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 those are now pieces mm. of the inner lining, lining. itself. Okay. And as that progresses, there will be wounds, mm. and those wounds will start to bleed, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
when you see that uh, blood stained or diarrhea, which is uh, what we call a dysentery, mm -hmm. you really have to be serious okay. because at that point now, one is at risk of having uh, the parasite get into blood mm -hmm. and move to the liver mm -hmm. or to the lungs, yeah. the brain. Okay. Yeah. All right. And of course, we we'll also talk about yeah what exactly happens when, of course, it gets itself into the yeah. liver, and of course, uh, we know the brain. Does it form like let's say pockets of infection, or what exactly mm -hmm. happens? Yeah. Now, so we talked about it's very important for someone, especially when you notice cases of blood stain. I mean, in your stool, of course, seek medical attention immediately because yeah. that is a sign that this thing is getting serious. Mm -hmm. But you earlier on, you also talked about the fact that there's some people who might not necessarily seek medical attention and the, let's say the body is able to fight you know the infection they get better and then probably after some time they also develop the infection again yeah. so for, especially for those people who let's say their immune system is really really good and mm. might not necessarily seek medical attention but they will be okay um if they do this or delay and the cycle continues over time mm -hmm. um does this accelerate the level at which now the bacteria will find itself into the liver, into the brain, and then, of course, cause more havoc? Mm -hmm. uh, those people who become, uh, we call them carriers. Mm. Those people who become uh, carriers, mm -hmm. uh, they will look and they will be normally, when you look at them, they will be okay. They're okay. Yeah. They are okay. Mm -hmm. But they will continue to pass the cysts mm -hmm. in their stool. Mm -hmm. And so, they can accidentally mm -hmm. pick the cyst from their own stool mm -hmm. and put it again into yeah. the mouth. Yeah. And it will go through the process mm -hmm. and become an active infection. Mm -hmm. So long as the cysts have changed to trophozoids, mm -hmm. they do not have an opportunity mm -hmm. of changing back to trophozoids mm -hmm. within the human body. All right. So they will have to come out mm -hmm. and then get swallowed. Mm -hmm. Uh, because uh, the acid in the stomach also mm -hmm. plays a role okay. in helping the breaking of the cyst so mm -hmm. that it becomes the trophozoids again. Mm -hmm. So those carriers, mm -hmm. unless now they pick it and through water or through food, through mm -hmm. their own fingers, mm -hmm. they will not have an active infection. Okay. But they will continue shedding mm -hmm. the cyst the in their stools mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and they are dangerous to the to community. The, okay. So that is why mm -hmm. we need to seek for treatment because Indeed. if one does not seek treatment mm -hmm. and they feel okay, mm -hmm. then they will not see the need. Okay. Yeah. And what about those who are asymptomatic? They, I, I want to believe they're also a danger to sure. the environment, to the society as well. Mm -hmm. But now how do they know that they have the infection? Uh, someone may not know mm -hmm. until they get uh, their stool tested. Okay. However, we have public health measures mm -hmm. of people whom we consider, uh, you know, is, uh, we consider them important in the transmission. Mm -hmm. uh, people who work in the hotel industry, mm -hmm. uh, food handlers, mm -hmm. uh, I think in the Public Health Act, they are supposed to go for yearly screening. Mm -hmm. And uh, they get checked mm -hmm. to make sure they are not shedding, amongst other yeah. organisms, mm -hmm. they are not shedding these cysts mm -hmm. uh, because they can easily pass them to mm -hmm. their customers. Mm -hmm. And we, which is, of course, one of the things you will hear of food poisoning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, okay. Now, th that makes sense because we hear cases of someone went later to a particular restaurant, uh, you know, ate from there, went home in cases of food poisoning. That is where it comes from. It might not necessarily could be, be one of the sources. Could be one of the sources. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about diagnosis. So it's very important, like we said, for someone to just go and get checked, mm -hmm. um, and especially those like, for instance, the food handlers. But now, but for the general population, um, do we have a case where they can, especially for those who probably are asymptomatic, mm -hmm. are they allowed to just go and get tested and just get checked? Generally, we do not have routine screening mm. for everybody. Mm -hmm. Uh, but when people go and they have issues of abdominal discomfort, mm -hmm. diarrhea, uh, the doctor seeing them mm -hmm. will most probably request okay. for a stool test. Okay. And the person in the lab will uh, try as much as possible mm -hmm. to screen for the various things mm -hmm. which they expect or they anticipate mm -hmm. to get in a stool. Mm -hmm. And uh, that will help. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the major challenges we have in our country is... Uh, a trade which I've seen where people want to go to the lab, mm -hmm. they have not been seen mm -hmm. by a physician, by a clinician, and they request the lab person to carry out a test for them. Mm -hmm. And whatever result they are given, they walk out 
moved to the next uh, drug store in mm. a pharmacy mm. and they medicate themselves. Okay. Now that is not the way to go mm -hmm. because if you are dealing with uh, those uh, cysts, uh, probably that is not what is causing your problem. You mm -hmm. may be having other uh, organisms which are making you have abdominal discomfort mm -hmm. and the person in the lab picked the cyst mm. and you go and you buy drugs, mm. you are doing the wrong thing. Yeah. So let people who have uh, issues with their health be seen. Okay. And the clinician will give them the right advice. Okay. Do yeah. not self-diagnose. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, yeah. uh, so this person, let's say, has symptoms, yeah. uh, then come, goes to a facility. So what happens during the diagnosis process and how long does that take? Mm. Mm. Uh, initially, the clinician will uh, take history of the person. Mm. And as they are taking the history at the back of their mind, mm. they are having options. Mm -hmm. What could be the reason behind Why? this? Yeah. And if they suspect that this person could be having amoebiasis, mm -hmm. uh, they would most probably request for a stool test. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a fairly rapid test. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy in the lab within 30 minutes mm -hmm. will have given their results. Mm -hmm. uh, if somebody is having diodious tools, mm. uh, the, the watery ones, mm -hmm. most probably the person in the lab will be able to pick the trophozoids, mm -hmm. the ones which are rapidly dividing and all that. Mm -hmm. If they are having formed tools, uh, they will pick the cysts. Mm -hmm. And uh, most probably the clinician will be now able to make up their mind mm -hmm. whether is it is this the primary reason why mm -hmm. this person is having the problem okay. or is it a secondary reason? Mm -hmm. And if they get to the conclusion that it is uh, amoebiasis, which is the main problem, mm -hmm. they will deal with it accord according to the conventions we have mm -hmm. here. Okay. Mm -hmm. right, and, and what exactly is that? I mean, the uh, conventions that uh, <laughs> are allowed or recommended? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Basically, I think uh, in our country we have... Uh, we have a regulated framework mm. of what drugs to use for what conditions. Mm. And for amoebiasis, if it is purely the decent reform, mm -hmm. uh, where you are having a blood stained area, mm -hmm. you would think of using uh, either metronidazole okay. or flagyl. Okay. Well, that is the, the, the common name in the market. Mm -hmm. Or you can use tinidazole. Okay. Th those are the two common drugs which are used. Okay. If there are other things which the clinician needs to take care of, mm. they will now add others mm. to address that. Because when somebody gets sick, mm. there are other issues mm -hmm. which may need also to be addressed. Okay. Do they have fever? Have they lost a lot of blood? Mm. You know, all those will come into play mm. when the clinician is coming to the final conclusion. Okay. But the main ones mm. which are made uh, to address that will be those two. Okay. If, if does, does the clinician think it is important mm. that they limit the number of diodious tools? Mm. You know, those kind of things will okay. come into play. All right. Yeah. Okay, and we have a question. Mm. Um, and this one says, is black stool normal when pregnant? Is black stool mm -hmm. normal, normal yeah. when pregnant? Mm -hmm. uh, black stool means that uh, the person mm -hmm. is bleeding up. Mm -hmm. And by the time uh, that blood is getting to the point of where it is mixing with the stools, mm -hmm. it has gotten broken down. Okay. And so unless they have been taking soil, mm -hmm. uh, that is something which they need to consult mm -hmm. with their clinician mm -hmm. to advise them. Mm -hmm. Are they having bleeding somewhere? Mm -hmm. uh, because that could be something Okay, Different. and what do you mean? What do you mean? Someone is, let's say, bleeding up. Yeah, somebody could be bleeding. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the bleedings which will come, uh, there could be some blood vessels oh, which sorry. are leaking blood. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. One of the common causes mm -hmm. of bleeding within the intestines mm -hmm. is because of um, we have hookworms. Mm -hmm. Who comes up okay. blood? 
All right. but they also cause bleeding. Okay. Yeah. All right. Can we also answer more on the same after a short break? Because we need to take a very short break right now. Right. So keep talking to us. The SMS number is 40975. Alternatively, call us live or 791-478-990 is the number to call in with your question. And we'll answer it as soon as we get it. We still have a lot to discuss on the other side of this commercial break. See you right after. All right, welcome back. If you are just joining us right now, today we are focusing on uh, amoebiasis, which of course we talked about um, the fact that it is a bacterial infection that enters the body through the mouth. And of course, there are other cases um, or risk factors to the same. And of course, we talked about the fact that hygiene is of paramount and children being uh, the most affected from amoebiasis. But then again, uh, talk to us if you have any other question on the same. The number is 0791-478-990. Or if you call in and the lines are busy, then feel free to send us a text message on 40975 with your name and your question. And of course, we'll answer it as soon as we get it. And before we went for break, we were addressing um, a question from one of the viewers who, were, uh, who was asking, is black stool normal when pregnant? And of course, you were answering um, you know, that aspect in the sense that there might be a case of bleeding um, up. So could we talk about what could actually cause bleeding? And of course, uh, the fact that this person is pregnant. So mm. there could be a number of reasons why and measures to be taken for the same. Okay. Uh, mm. bas basically, what is critical is that the person is pregnant. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are seeing that there is a change mm. in their stool. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I said, we would be interested to mm. know, are mm. they taking soil? Mm. Are they taking a lot of uh, the ferrous sulfate tablets? Mm -hmm. uh, those kind of things. But it will be important for mm -hmm. them to be seen mm -hmm. by a clinician. Mm -hmm. Because uh, even if we were to say that they are having some blood vessels which are bleeding, mm and the blood is getting broken down, mm -hmm. uh, we cannot be certain. Mm -hmm. And the fact that she's pregnant, it makes it more urgent for her to see mm -hmm. a specialized person okay. so that they can get her device. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, the, the, the other cause of bleeding up the gastrointestinal system mm -hmm. uh, could be hookworms. And you see, they are also competing with the, with the person mm -hmm. for blood. Mm -hmm. And uh, that disadvantages the child. Okay. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Can it get itself into the child? Or? No, they will not get into the child. Mm -hmm. But when blood levels go low, mm -hmm. it means the child, because the child is feeding, mm -hmm. is feeding mm -hmm. through blood. Mm -hmm. the, the mother's blood is passing nutrients okay. to the child. Mm -hmm. So if the blood levels of the mother go down, the child gets... Uh, disadvantaged okay yeah all right and and also um we earlier on talked about the fact that of course the amoeba itself can find itself into the liver mm -hmm. and of course the brain as well yeah. so let's stay start with the liver um how does it get itself in there and what could happen once um you know the of course the bacteria gets itself into the liver mm -hmm. uh mm, okay when we are having digestion taking place mm -hmm most of the nutrients will get into blood mm. and this blood goes to the liver okay so much of the blood supply mm -hmm. of the intestines finds its way to the liver mm -hmm. and that is why you find the liver mm -hmm. is a common destination mm -hmm. of uh, those uh, uh, those uh, amoeba which will get into circulation mm -hmm. if it gets into the liver it will get there and uh, it will continue to multiply. Mm. It will uh, form uh, a liver abscess. Mm. There will be accumulation of pus mm. within the liver. Mm. And uh, depending on which part of the liver is involved, mm -hmm. there will be swelling. So mm. the person will start experiencing uh, pain mm. on that side of the chest, which is uh, the right side. Mm. And uh, in some cases, the swelling may increase because mm -hmm. the abscess may increase mm -hmm. and eventually it will burst. Mm -hmm. Now, if it bursts, that becomes uh, a dangerous scenario mm -hmm. because depending on where it is located, mm -hmm. it can release the pus within uh, the peritoneum. That, that is the area below mm -hmm. where you have the intestines and other structures mm -hmm. and that will cause inflammation and infection in that area. Yeah. It can also burst within the chest cavity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that will also have its own implications, mm -hmm. where there will be accumulation of pus around the lungs, mm -hmm. near the heart, and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And that 
will have its own effects like difficulties in breathing mm. and the person becomes more sick. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and uh, before we get into what happens when it gets itself into the brain, yes. um, we have another question. And this one says, hi, I was diagnosed with amoeba and was given a drug, Diracip, MDS. Mm -hmm. um, the leaflet said a nursing mother shouldn't use them. Are there optional drugs? This is Kate from Nairobi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question because, as I've said, we have a problem of even self-medication where people are going there and they're buying whatever. Uh, we have drugs which are supposed to be used in pregnancy and uh, to nursing mothers. And uh, because that is, a, I would call it a specialized area, I would not like uh, to you know, to start saying, oh, go and use paramomycin and those kind of drugs because let the clinician decide mm -hmm. see the clinician mm -hmm. tell them i'm breastfeeding okay. i'm pregnant all right uh, they, they will know what to give you mm -hmm. yeah but suppose they were given let's say before they got pregnant mm -hmm. or before they started okay this person might be nursing still but yeah suppose <laughs> they were given it before they got pregnant all right or when let's say they had taken a break from nursing yeah yeah what could happen could they just go back and ask for let's say an optional medicine uh, okay, uh, you know, we would not mention the duration of yes. how long you take the medication. Yeah. Uh, if you are taking tinidazole, probably mm -hmm. take it for three days. Mm -hmm. If you are taking uh, metronidazole, mm -hmm. uh, which may be combined with uh, diloxone and furid mm -hmm. sometimes, mm -hmm. you take it for five days. Okay. So it's not something you're going to take for a for long, long time. time. Okay. Such that, oh, I've been taking this drug for two months now. When I began, I was not pregnant. Okay. And <laughs> then... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. But now that she has um, probably started taking the medication, mm -hmm. um, yeah, what could happen to her if she continues taking the medication and she's nursing? Uh, my advice would be let her discuss her concerns okay. with, with the, the person who yeah. gave the medication. Okay. Yeah. That, that right. way they will get a good compromise. All right. Yeah. Okay. Now, what happens when the bacteria gets into the brain? Uh, if it gets into the brain, it will have the same scenario mm -hmm. where there will be an abscess. Mm -hmm. And depending on which part of the brain is involved, mm -hmm. uh, there will be, you know, some challenges mm -hmm. like headache, mm -hmm. uh, loss of some of the functions uh, because the brain controls mm -hmm. the rest of the body. Mm -hmm. And so depending on where the abscess is formed, mm -hmm. uh, it will interfere with the, the parts of the body mm -hmm which are regulated by that part of the brain. Mm -hmm. and, and basically, uh, when somebody is having those challenges, mm -hmm. if they go uh, to a hospital, mm -hmm. they will be requested to do some tests mm -hmm. to show, mm -hmm. do we have some growth? Do we have some abscesses within the brain? Mm -hmm. And uh, that will now advise or it will inform mm -hmm. what decisions will be done after mm -hmm. that. Okay. Yeah. All right. And do we know how long it takes, let's say, from the bacteria getting into the liver and into the brain? And while at it, what is happening to, let's say, this person's stomach? Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, basically, during uh, what I would call uh, the most serious stage, mm. which is now when the person is having diarrhea stools mm. and probably it has progressed to dysentery, mm. which is blood stained diarrhea, mm -hmm. uh, the parasite now gets into circulation. Mm. And uh, when it gets in circulation, mm. it will find its way to the mm. liver, to the lungs, mm -hmm. to the brain. Okay. And when it gets there, it will take time mm. to establish itself. Mm. You may have six months, mm -hmm. you may have one year, depending on what I said, the immune status of the person. Mm. So it is not as immediate as okay. the diarrhea. All right. But you see, it is coming as a result of not taking care of the diarrhea. Mm. So if you are quick in taking care of the diarrhea, mm -hmm. these other problems will not come in. Okay. And we have seen people who have stayed, with, uh, who have stayed for long mm -hmm. with those uh, problems of having uh, chest pain. Uh, the liver is getting enlarged mm -hmm. and it continues to enlarge because they are saying, okay, th this pain is not as severe. Yeah, so it, it continues, it continues. Yeah. And when they are going to the health facility, maybe they have been with this pain for two years. Mm -hmm. And you get some cases where they have really stayed. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the abscess does not stop. Mm -hmm. It keeps on increasing. Okay. Yeah. All right. And, and um, how would you say the pain is in terms of, because people might be like, oh, this is just a, 
normal chest pain, it will go away on its own. But the one where now the bacteria is in the liver, of course, the liver is, you know, mm -hmm. let's say enlarging, or the one probably that, uh, you know, is in the lungs. How would, how can someone differentiate between a pain coming from the liver being enlarged out of the infection from the bacteria mm -hmm. and just normal chest pain? Uh, pain due to enlargement of the liver, mm -hmm. the onset is usually slow. All right. It is gradual, mm -hmm. and it keeps on. As the liver enlarges, it mm -hmm. keeps on increasing. Okay. Dull ache kind of pain mm. and so sometimes we may ignore mm -hmm. because it's not like the chest pain which comes as a result of having problems with the lungs mm. and you having problems with breathing mm -hmm. and you feel like if i don't see the clinician i'm mm -hmm. going to die like now so yeah. you rush mm -hmm. uh, so the one involving the liver may get ignored mm -hmm. if it is touching on the heart mm -hmm. uh, quite a tough pain there where one will seek attention very fast. Mm -hmm. So this one tends to get ignored because it is dull, mm. it is slow, mm -hmm. you know, and it progresses slowly, slowly. Okay, yeah. all right. And then for the brain, mm -hmm. what is like the most severe complication that might arise from the same, that mm -hmm. is the bacteria being in the brain? Uh, what I've said, uh, depending on which part of the body, I mean, which part of, of the, the brain, brain yeah. because like, um, let's say, for example, mm -hmm. if uh, this abscess gets to the part of the brain which controls the, the arms, mm -hmm. you will find there will be weakness of the mm -hmm. arms. If it is part of the brain which is interfering with the sight, mm -hmm. the person will have difficulties with seeing. Mm -hmm. You know, those kind of things. Okay. And that's why uh, the earliest indication mm -hmm. would be change in uh, sensation. You know, like mm -hmm. when you're feeling like you're touching something mm -hmm. and you are like, I'm not feeling like I'm touching. Okay. Or the, the tinkling sensations. Mm -hmm. Those will be the earliest indication. That is something mm -hmm. which is happening, uh, happening on my nerves. Okay. Uh, but if it gets into the brain, that will not be alone. There will be a deck mm -hmm. because of the involvement. Okay. Yeah. All right, now let's talk about treatment um, mm -hmm. of amoebiasis. And, and um, how long does it take before someone is completely okay mm -hmm. from amoebiasis? Uh, the good news with uh, amoebiasis, especially uh, what we call uh, the colitic type, the one which is causing problems in the gut, in mm -hmm. the intestines, mm -hmm. it, it tends to respond fairly fast okay. to medication. Mm -hmm. And uh, the moment somebody starts on taking medication, within 48 hours, mm -hmm. they will be free of the symptoms. Oh. However, okay. it is important that somebody completes. Okay, yeah. Completes the dosage. All right. And, and I want to insist that because that is where we have our challenge. Mm -hmm. You take uh, for two days and you're like, ah, I'm okay. I'm okay, uh, yeah. No more rushing to the loose or you I don't the know. medication. And these drugs are giving me full test in the mouth, so mm. let me not take them. Okay. It's important that, because mm -hmm. what happens, you see, the drug will initially deal with the, 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 the trophozoids, which mm -hmm. are rapidly dividing. Mm -hmm. But then you need to have adequate concentrations of the drug within mm -hmm. your body mm -hmm. to deal with the cysts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so how long roughly are we talking about? We we talked about of course two days. Five someone days. Okay. So five days. F complete the. If, if you are on uh, a combination of uh, metronidazole and aloxanide furoid, it's mm -hmm. five days. Okay. You take for five days, mm -hmm. complete the dosage, mm -hmm. you are good to go. Okay. But then, what about uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh Three days. Okay. Now, what about uh, cases where someone has the infection, of course, and has progressed to the liver, to the brain? Mm -hmm. Is the medication the same? And then also the duration of when a person is supposed to be on medication, the same? Uh, besides uh, what we're talking about, mm -hmm. uh, you see now here other things are coming. True. There is pus, mm -hmm. and the pus needs to be drained. Mm -hmm. So now these will involve being taken to theatre mm -hmm. and... Uh, the pass is drained. Mm. And when the pass is drained, depending on what they will find, mm -hmm. uh, they will decide on uh, do they give you drugs through the veins mm. uh, or do they clean and dress you for some time, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of thing, depending okay. on what they are seeing. Mm -hmm. But that uh, generally will take a longer period of time. So okay. there is surgical intervention mm -hmm. where now, depending 
on what they have seen in the investigations, mm -hmm. then they will proceed. Okay. Yeah. All right. And what about the children? Because, I mean, sometimes, you know, it's, it might be difficult to get the children to stay on medication, I mean, throughout. Most of them, like, and from what she said, with the foul smell, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the mouth, most of them, of course, might not be okay with the same. So, mm -hmm. in terms of the medication for the children, is it the same as um, adults? And then are they also supposed to be um, on medication for five days, depending on whether the infection has gone to the mm. other parts of the body? Uh, children, mm -hmm. their medication is actually the same. Mm. Uh, although we do not uh, give tinnitus to children, mm. so they will be given, uh, we have a syrup, which is a combination of metronidas or andaloxonide mm -hmm. mm -hmm. The good thing with those suspensions, they are flavored. So mm. they make the okay. test good. Mm -hmm. And uh, we really have to be serious with the complete, completing the dosage. Mm -hmm. So we have to insist that mm -hmm. they complete. Okay. Uh, but notwithstanding, mm -hmm. when you're dealing with the children, we, we, we must focus on hygiene. Mm -hmm. Let's be clear about that. Okay. Because we are treating the infection because there was, you know, a break in our ways of preventing. Mm -hmm. So if we prevent, mm -hmm. then we will not get yeah. there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, and um, after the treatment, yeah. are there, let's say, side effects, um, you know, related to the same, whether after or during treatment, are there, let's say, side effects related to the drugs that someone is taking? Mm -hmm. uh, those drugs, especially tinidazole and metronidazole, mm -hmm. they cause uh, a funny test in the mm -hmm. mouth. And uh, that test will continue mm -hmm. for like uh, 24, 48 hours after one is through the medication. Okay. Uh, a point of caution if one is taking those drugs, mm -hmm. they should not take alcohol. Okay. They, 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 they are incompatible. Mm -hmm. They will have uh, other problems. Okay. What exactly happens? Because that is what I was about to ask. <laughs> oh, okay. So for the entire, let's like, say, five days when they are on yeah. medication, avoid alcohol. Avoid alcohol. What will happen if they take? Uh, well, uh, that drug interferes with the... Uh, breakdown of alcohol mm. and uh, it makes this person have very severe vomiting mm. okay. yeah mm -hmm. and uh, that would not be a good experience mm. because mm. sometimes uh, it's good for people to know mm -hmm. if you are taking this medication please stay away, stay away from yeah. and you know we may say okay what else think of anything which mm. may be having alcohol content in, in it. it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So no matter how small, you know, so yes. I'll be like, okay, let me take this something else. Mm. The percentage is mm -hmm. little. Yeah. So it won't have an effect. Uh, no, it, it will. It will. It will. Yeah. Okay. Will. All right. And then so after medication, are there chances of, let's say, recurrence um, of the same as long as one does not maintain, you know, good standards of hygiene? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, pretty so because uh, we do not develop immunity. Yeah, against uh, amoebiasis. Mm. So, if I'm having amoebiasis today and mm. I get treated mm -hmm. and I'm okay, mm. and uh, assuming the medication I used helped to clear the cyst and I'm okay, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm going on with my life and I go downtown, mm -hmm. a place where they are serving salad and stuff, mm -hmm. and I take it, and maybe the salad was contaminated, mm -hmm. definitely. I will be on the same chain again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what do we do? I mean, so do we avoid taking foods from outside or what happens? I mean, yes, we might, let's say, maintain good standards of hygiene mm -hmm. in our own homes. Yeah. But now, you <coughs> see, we cannot really say what happens outside in terms of how the food is handled and how the food is prepared. Mm -hmm. So do we avoid completely taking foods, uh, you know, from outside or what happens to ensure that we prevent cases of, you know, I mean, BSs and I mean, infections? Uh, I would say be mindful of where you take, you take your, your meals. Okay. And uh, be mindful mm -hmm. of the water you use. Mm -hmm. uh, those two uh, will save you a lot of trouble. Mm. Uh, of course, I think it's important that I mention mm -hmm. that chlorination of water alone does not solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Because we may say, okay, I bought this water from the vendor, mm -hmm. let me add a few drops of uh, a water guard or whatever, yes. and I'm good to go. Mm -hmm. uh, chlorine does not destroy the cysts. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what do we do? Do we are we supposed to boil? Boiling. Boiling. Boiling, water? Bo boiling is uh, okay. better. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the reason why I say the, the city cans or tap water mm -hmm. is safe is because. Besides uh, adding chlorine, mm. when they are doing the treatment process, mm -hmm. they do filtration. Mm. And when they do filtration, they remove the cysts, mm. if there were cysts in the water. Okay. So that helps. Okay. Yeah. All right, so make sure that you boil. And especially this is to people who are not using, of course, the word we're saying, um, city council, or they can alternatively, or probably those who use water from the borehole, mm -hmm. it's important to boil them. Yeah. Okay. Of, All right. of course, uh, another observation which mm -hmm. we really have to put across to the mm -hmm. public mm -hmm. is uh, because I will say, okay, my water is from the city council, mm -hmm. so it is safe. But mm -hmm. where are these pipes passing? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. You walk in some of the places and you see, you know, they have been tied using elastic bands mm -hmm. and uh, they are leaking mm -hmm. and beside there is, you know, a sewer, mm -hmm. and this kind of thing. So the water just gets contaminated. Mm -hmm. And although from the source mm -hmm. it was Okay, safe, yeah. by the time it is getting to you, mm -hmm. it has been That's contaminated. So yeah. uh, there are those dynamics. All right. So yeah. just bottom line, just boil your drinking water. Boil it. That's it. Yeah. All right. And what about food in terms of handling? I know we talk about wash your fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. um, before cooking, and then when you cook, make sure that you cook them properly. Mm -hmm. But most of us will just especially for fruits, just do the standard running water and then that's it, mm -hmm. all right? So in terms of <laughs> making sure that the food is properly, yeah. um, especially for the fruits and vegetables, properly um, cleaned. I know there, I mean, with technology, there are some things that, you know, probably could be put into the water or yeah. there's some machines for the same to help you clean uh, fruits and vegetables. But if you cannot afford that, what is the best way to ensure that your fruits and vegetables are well cleaned? They are well cleaned mm. and they are safe for mm. taking. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, you have mentioned it by passing, where you use mm. uh, running water. Yeah. Uh, th that is a, a good measure. But for these conditions, all mm. these diseases which have got to do with uh, issues of fingers, mm. food, mm -hmm. feces, mm -hmm. uh, issues of washing hands mm. and proper disposal of human waste, mm. that is like the bottom line. Okay. And, uh, now, preparation of food, mm. you know, we have flies. I think we, we used to be taught about the five herbs of those mm. diseases. Mm. So flies will go, land on a stool specimen somewhere, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. come and land on your food. Your food. Mm. The food was prepared very well. Mm -hmm. And on the table, it was okay mm -hmm. until the fly came and landed there. Yeah. And uh, it uh, had some cyst on it. Mm -hmm. So all those dynamics, mm -hmm. they come into play. Okay. Yeah. All right. So just proper management of food, of course, ensure that you boil your water and all that. Now, yeah. when someone, like during the period when someone has a um, maybe yeses, are there mm -hmm. some of the foods, let's say, that they are supposed to avoid? Mm -hmm. um, or what happens so that we do not accelerate the level at which, again, um, you know, the seeds either multiply and, of course, you know, cause more havoc, mm -hmm. get itself into the liver or the brain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, we do not have, uh, you know, pure contraindications mm -hmm. of foods mm -hmm. in regard to amoebiasis. Okay. However, mm -hmm. you would like to take foods which are easily digested mm -hmm. and they are easily absorbed. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, such foods which mm -hmm. are like take longer. Mm -hmm. uh, like when somebody is taking fresh milk, mm -hmm. that takes longer. Mm -hmm. And uh, they should avoid that during that time. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you must take milk, take fermented milk, it is easier to digest. Mm -hmm. So okay. those are the dynamics mm -hmm. one would like to consider. Mm -hmm. uh, proteins, uh, generally would take a longer time to digest. So those mm -hmm. are the foods you would be thinking of mm -hmm. during the interim period. Okay. Not really a pure contraindication. Okay. Yeah. All right. And someone might argue and say, okay, but what if, and especially for the proteins, mm -hmm. what if I cook it properly, ensure that it's well cooked and, you know, mm -hmm. all that. I can't even have like a piece or two of, let's say, we meat. are talking of that interim period okay. when you are really having uh, severe diarrhea, mm -hmm. and uh, you also want your gut to rest mm. because uh, you are thinking of resting mm -hmm. your stomach, okay. you are resting your intestines because they are the ones which are inflamed. Mm -hmm. uh, so you want them to rest. Yeah, you, you mm -hmm. want them mm -hmm. to rest because mm -hmm. sometimes we may have a, a severe form of mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. infection. And it will interfere with the, especially parts of the colon mm. and make them become uh, kind of paralyzed. Mm. And 
uh, you really have to be aware of those small, small things mm -hmm. which may cause trouble. So mm -hmm. at that time, mm -hmm. you want, okay, you need the energy, mm. but you also want to rest your system. Your system. A bit. Okay. Yeah. So what if I take, um, let's say, fruit salad, vegetable salad, or uh, <laughs> if I do like green juice to help cleanse oh. my colon and all that. Because remember this person is um, dehydrated mm -hmm. in the first place. Yeah. So if they take, let's say things that help mm. in fighting the disease, but as well also ensure that they have, they are well hydrated. Uh, that, that would be interesting to do because why do you want to detox when you when are you're having <laughs> other problems? Okay. Uh, just manage your problems first. First, okay. Get well, uh -huh. then do detox. Don't combine. All right. If you must, take, take clear fluids. Okay. Take clear soups. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And um, so you talked about fermented milk is much more mm -hmm. advisable to take yeah. at that time. Okay. Yeah. What about yogurt and, you know, yeah, yogurt is probiotics? in that class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are in that class. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, and what about water intake? Are they also advised to take mm -hmm. force a lot of water at that time? A lot of it. And <clears> is it <throat> the same as, you know how when you have diarrhea, you're told to um, take warm water with mm -hmm. salts and, of course, a little bit of sugar? Yeah. So during this period, are they also advised to take the same? Uh, pro pretty so, because the mm -hmm. science behind that, mm -hmm. I say this person will be losing water mm -hmm. and they will be losing minerals. Mm -hmm. So why you are adding sugar mm -hmm. and some salt mm -hmm. is you are putting some mm -hmm. minerals there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are thinking of mm -hmm. the major ones which mm -hmm. get lost mm -hmm. and which have an implication. Mm -hmm. So if one, depending on how many times they are going to the washroom, mm -hmm. if there is a need, mm -hmm. then uh, whoever is seeing them, Okay. We'll uh, maybe put uh, three sachets of ORIS mm. plus zinc okay. and that will help. And they will be okay. Yeah. All right. So thank you very much for coming over today. We have to end the show right now. But as you're parting short, <laughs> what is the baseline that all the people out there watching us right now need to know as far as either preventing or helping in, um, you know, maintaining high standards of hygiene, of course, to, to um, prevent cases of amoebiasis, either in children and in adults? Uh, I would say that uh, preventing these uh, infections, mm -hmm. which have got to do with uh, uh, feces and fingers, mm -hmm. it begins at home. Mm -hmm. The moment we train children on uh, washing hands mm -hmm. before taking meals, mm -hmm. washing hands after visiting the loo, mm -hmm. uh, it will go a long a way, long way. All in right. uh, getting that culture inculcated in okay. us. Yeah. All right. Again, so thank you so much for coming over today. And of course, thank you for staying with us till the end of the show. We have to end it here. My name is Winnie Lubembe. On behalf of everybody who made the show a success, we wish you a lovely day ahead. And now you have information on what Amibiasis is all about. See you again next week on Monday, same time, same place on My Doctor. Goodbye for now. <laughs>